were held inside this cubicle. Oh, come on. People have got to get out of this cocooning phase and into the experiential phase. You put them in the cocoon. <laughs>
реалистично. Все, погрузили меня в скорую, поехали, отъехали там на какое-то расстояние. И тут я начал умирать. Мне начали проводить реанимационные мероприятия, проводили их минут 20. Реанимация оказалась неудачной. Я умер. A photo of Babchenko, face down in a pool of blood, was released to prove that he'd been killed. It sent journalists and politicians into a frenzy. Both Russia and Ukraine started blaming each other. В итоге, в конце концов, занесли в морг. И когда ворота морга за мной закрылись, только в этот момент я и ожил. Мне принесли пачку сигарет, стакан чая, включили телевизор, и я вот голый, завернувшись в эту простыню, как Ганди сидел, курил и смотрел, что про меня рассказывают по телевизору, каким хорошим парнем я был. The SBU says the news of the murder flushed the middleman into the open, and they arrested him. He says he was working with the SBU the whole time and always knew the murder would be faked. The operation concluded. Babchenko appeared at a dramatic news event to reveal the truth. Russia is at the front line of hybrid warfare and they've been at the center of the discussion around fake news. And what some people have said is that after your death was revealed to be a staged operation by the SBU, what you've done is you've handed the Kremlin a propaganda victory. Уже было два брифинга из БУ, на втором брифинге уже были показаны доказательства, на мой взгляд, уже достаточно доказательства того, что все это делала Россия, что это никакой не фейк news, что все это делать действительно было надо, во-первых. Во-вторых, Имитация убийства – это обычный, стандартный по способ расследования заказных убийств. Он применяется по всему миру, в том числе и в Соединенных Штатах. Поэтому, когда начинают говорить про фейк news, про то, что мы теперь больше не будем, что журналистика пропала, мы теперь больше не будем верить, ну не верьте, господи, да кто вас заставляет, что ли. Спецслужбы Украины в этом случае сработали просто на пятерку. Criticize this operation. Did you, after your press conference, did you feel pressure? Did you feel under attack by them, or did you not care? By them? By the people who came out and criticized the operation. Oh come on! Понимаете, в чем дело? Моя жизнь сейчас изменилась настолько кардинально, что перед вами сижу в тех самых штанах в которых я был в морге. У меня он дырка на кроссовке, я не могу себе поменять кроссовки, потому что для меня сейчас невозможно выйти даже в магазин. Я понятия не имею, как моя дочь будет ходить в школу, потому что сейчас для моей дочери ходить в школу это очень-очень большая проблема. Я не могу ходить на работу, я не могу никуда ходить, я не могу ни с кем встречаться. И вы меня спрашиваете, чувствую ли я давление со стороны журналистов, которые меня критикуют. Это в моих жизненных приоритетах сейчас на таком 125-м месте. Я чувствую давление со стороны Российской Федерации, которая хочет меня убить. Вот это давление я чувствую. Raqqa, Syria was once the center of operations for ISIS. In October, Syrian defense forces celebrated retaking the city by raising yellow flags in its former soccer stadium. That's where ISIS fighters had made their last stand, at the end of a bloody four-month battle. Now, as people begin to return to normal lives in Raqqa, they're bringing games back to the Black Stadium. How are your football skills? You're a good player. All right, let's see your skills. <laughs> this is the first time that 19-year-old Talib Abu Ayash has been inside the Black Stadium since he was taken here as a prisoner. The stadium was once a headquarters for ISIS, and according to Syrian Democratic Forces, it was also the group's biggest prison in Raqqa. Evidence of how ISIS carried out justice could be seen right outside, where the heads of prisoners were spiked on an iron fence. Get out. I'm 
وخلاص بس اتركوني ما وما تركوني بس فوتوني من هي Talib was brought into the belly of the stadium, jailed alongside dozens of other prisoners accused of a variety of crimes. And to get some of them to confess, ISIS turned a locker room into an interrogation chamber, with gym equipment remade into torture devices. You were held inside this cubicle? Why did they bring you here? شعري هم لازم شعر طويل لوحيته طويل ف شعري ما كان اسبا اسبايك So this hair is what got you put in here? ااا كان يجي واحد بحديده يضرب الباب ويكب مي ويجي زاد كل وحده زاد نفس العمليه كل شغل ساعة ساعتين يكبون علي المي مشان ما انا طبعاً يعني هنا ما ما أنا مخلص حدا إنه خاف إنه بيحد في سفوس ما أقدر حتى صديقي يعني أعرفه قديم من زمان ما شفته ما أقدر أحكي له شيء خاف إنه يعني متعامل مع داعش خايف وما خايف لا يذبحوني. What does this writing say? يمنع دخول السجن تحت طائلة المسألة. Inmates afraid that their families would never know where they ended up wrote their names on the walls. Some counted their days of imprisonment. Nearby, there are messages from ISIS fighters who may have also spent their last days in these rooms. The stadium was one of the group's last holdouts in Raqqa, and to survive, fighters booby-trapped halls and built tunnels. What do you think was going on in this room? يعني الطرف هذا الأكثر كان العناصر الداعش والطرف هذا أكثر شيء للسجن والحمامات وغيره. Did you see any women down here? أسمع أصوات أزيديات. When the Syrian Democratic Forces liberated Raqqa, they found women from Iraq's Yazidi minority who had been held as slaves. What did they do with the women here? ما شفت بس اسمع اصواتهم حتى يعلمونا انه تسلم يقصبون انت تسلم. Did you see anyone being killed down here? يضربون ضرب اما قتل لا بس كان واحد محكوم قصاص. Talib was lucky. Locals say most people who entered the Black Stadium never returned home. You okay? Tamam? Okay. So how does it feel to be back? Today, the president welcomed workers and CEOs to the White House to announce the establishment of the National Council for the American Worker. Today, 23 companies and associations are pledging to expand apprenticeships. That's an interesting word for me to be saying, right? The apprentice. I never actually put that together until just now. The Council is supposed to work on a strategy to help Americans gain access to education and training for the kind of highly skilled jobs that are available in this country right now. Trump, again, talked about record low unemployment, especially among African Americans and Hispanics. He likes this talking point. African American unemployment has reached its lowest level in American history. And the president is pretty much right about the numbers. African American unemployment for the month of June was 6.5%, and for Hispanics, it was 4.6%. The overall trend has been downward since the Great Recession in 2008. But context and comparisons matter, and the unemployment rate for whites in America is currently 3.5%. And I think when he says that, people hear that like black workers are doing as well as white workers, which is not what he's saying. And he's actually never said that. He just says they're doing better than a generation ago. And that's great, but I want the benchmark to be doing as well as white workers. I don't want it to be doing as well as my grandparents were doing. 
Janelle Jones is an analyst for the nonpartisan Economic Policy Institute. The unemployment rate only counts people who are in the labor market. So you have to be actively looking for work. So the thing that it leaves out is all of the workers who are completely disconnected from the labor market. One in four prime age black men is actually disconnected from the labor market altogether. It also doesn't include the um, institutionalized population. So black men in prison and jails are also not included. Which basically means that that the unemployment rate is calculated as though those people don't exist? Sadly, yes, it is calculated as if they do not exist. The president also spoke about educating former prisoners so they can find work. But educating people and convincing employers to agree to hire them can be two different things. So I obviously support education, but it's not a, a solution for racial inequality in the labor market. You know, if people just were all economic majors or if they were all STEM majors, um, then black workers wouldn't be left behind, but we see that that's not the case. And when you say left behind, what do you mean? We still have a lower number of black workers who are working than they were before the Great Recession. We see that the wealth that black families lost in the Great Recession has not been recovered. Um, and we see that in terms of unemployment rates. Another measure that gets released by the government quarterly, but doesn't get as much fanfare, is a look at how much people are earning. For the second quarter of the year, the median weekly wage for an American worker was $876. Broken down by race, Asian Americans topped the list, followed by whites. And then there was more than a $200 drop-off, with African Americans at $683 a week and Hispanics at $674. While 23 companies and organizations pledge to train over 3 million people today, the executive order doesn't mention funding for the projects that will be developed, just that the council will work with Congress and examine how government money is currently spent. So without knowing more about the money, the executive order that Trump signed, like so many other presidents have signed before him, may end up just being a piece of paper. Movie theater attendance is the lowest it's been since 1995. You know, people have got to get out of this cocooning phase and into the experiential phase. You put them in the cocoon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you did Netflix. You put us in the cocoon, man. Mitch Lowe is the CEO of MoviePass, a company that lets you see a movie a day for 10 bucks a month. It's like Netflix for movie theaters. And not so coincidentally, Mitch was also the co-founder of Netflix. MoviePass is doing the same thing in a, a little bit different way, really by giving people bad movie insurance. So worst case scenario, you, you didn't waste a bunch of money, you just wasted a couple hours. And, and you can walk out. Just a few months ago, we were only nine people in the whole company, and now we're like over 50 people. So in the interim, you're in the WeWork? Yeah, we're in the WeWork, and it's allowed us to scale kind of month by month. When MoviePass started in 2011, it cost up to $50 a month. At the time, the average price of a movie ticket in the U.S. was about $8, meaning you'd have to see seven movies a month to get the most out of your subscription. But when the company dropped prices to $10 last August, the price to see one movie evened out to be about the same price as the pass itself, and you get to see an unlimited number of movies each month. Not surprisingly, subscriptions jumped from $20,000 to over $3 million. Today, we're buying about 6% of all the movie tickets in the U.S. When we get to 5 million, we're going to be buying one in five tickets nationwide for all films by the end of the year. By the end of this year? By the end of this year. How does the math work? Because even if somebody's going once a month, it seems like, best case scenario, you're losing some money. Yeah, a couple bucks. I don't know if you know this, but 89% of moviegoers only go four times a year. The way we make money is by getting a lot of people from that occasional moviegoer group. Because it's 2018, MoviePass isn't trying to make money off the service itself. It's trying to make money off of you and your data. You know, the reason we're able to offer you an extraordinary low price is because we're going to monetize uh, the data to sell you things, uh, to create kind of an open table for your night at the movies. Mm. So we'll be working with restaurants and bars and build deals like maybe you get a dollar off or you get a free appetizer or with babysitting you get a free hour. And of course, you know, we'll make a percentage of the revenue that you would spend there. Is there a way where I can just have a movie pass subscription, you don't have my data, I get to see my movies and you just leave me alone? 
There's a couple things you can opt out of and some things you can't. If you opt out of any location service, our app doesn't work. So, you know, for customers who, who don't want that, they shouldn't join. For all his confidence in interviews, MoviePass isn't acting like a company that knows what it's doing. In the past few months, it banned certain theaters from its app, lowered prices twice, turned around and unbanned those theaters, canceled its unlimited plan, and then brought it back. And it recently introduced surge pricing. MoviePass lost an estimated $45 million in June alone. So the company's unveiled a plan to raise another billion dollars from investors and do what's called a reverse stock split, which would at least temporarily boost the stock price. Shareholders vote on these ideas on Monday. Stock dropped right. quite heavily, actually. Right. Very similar to Netflix in the early days. What, first five years, you guys yeah. were heavily shorted because people think it's not gonna work. When people understand the Wall Street side, like our institutions, not worried at all. I mean, they're the ones that keep re-upping on all the monies. You know, we hear uh, people are betting you could make it through the holidays, through Christmas. Mm -hmm. Then they said you couldn't make it through uh, Oscar season. Then they said you're not going to make it through May. They'll always, they'll always say that. Hunt. Am I gonna have a bunch of people hating me after this? Hey up there, I'm on my way up. Set a radio to play us. Blame it on a place I grew up. I love it. I liked the song three seconds in with the first two chords, to be honest with you. I didn't expect it to go where it went. I would not direct a video in a nightclub or a limousine with a bunch of girls half naked and strobe lights and people wearing sunglasses indoors. My favorite part about it is that it made me enjoy something I typically don't gravitate towards liking, so. I would have never picked the samples that the drums had myself. The drums just don't sound good. So if I was at a restaurant that song would have been playing, I would have probably not paid attention to it. Lipstick and pancake, Queen of I don't like that. Ugh. This is just not my thing at all, I'm sorry. It started out with two words that just felt awkward to sing. Something with pancakes. I don't know if I would sing a song about pancakes personally. <laughs> I like this chair, I wouldn't write a song about it. It's a beautiful life. If you give it a chance, it can make you dance. It's a beautiful life. All right. Reminded me a little bit musically of Get Lucky, Daft Punk, Pharrell. I could not, not think about it. Reminded me of like old disco celebration songs a little bit. Obviously produced in a more modern way. Who is it by? This is by Rick Astley. He still makes music? Wow. Uh, damn. Something about knowing who it is makes it funny. Probably because of all the memes and all the pranks people have played. So this one just can't be rated because, because of the internet culture. It ruined it for me. And it's a crazy place. Don't get lost. Have people died in this area from mine explosions? One. After a few days, a few days, three days. The first thing is to get out of the water and then get out of the water. 